At the beginning of the school year, usually the first thing that we get through in a chemistry class is how we identify matter, atoms and molecules and mixtures, and then classifying things into those various categories. After that, though, when we get to the idea of a mixture, heterogeneous and homogeneous, I usually start talking about how do we get around separating mixtures. And there's lots of ways. There are physical properties. You can filter something that's solid away from something that's a solution. You can separate things based on their boiling point through distillation. You can separate things based on magnetic properties. But one of the most powerful systems of separating mixtures for scientists today is processes called chromatography. Now, I found out my first year at my current school that most of my students have already seen the little strip of black marker and the white sheet of paper and stick into the liquid and it starts to climb up and separate by color. And I was actually shocked that they'd, most of them said, oh yeah, we saw this in elementary school. Now, they probably didn't know the reason why all of that was working, that the capillary action was pulling the water across the paper and that the dyes were separating based on polarity, excuse me, based on polarity, but they've seen chromatography. So I wanted to give them a different way of seeing chromatography that wasn't the old paper with the black marker that they'd all already seen before. So there is something called a set pack C18 cartridge. Uh, if you order it, uh, they come, Flynn Scientific carries them in the catalog, and it doesn't really look like much, but what it is here is you've got beads on the inside surrounded by a polymer of carbon-18 chains, well, it's not really a polymer, but carbon-18 chains, it's completely nonpolar on the inside. But what this does allow you to do is to separate a mixture that students are very familiar with. One of the things I'm always striving for in my classroom is to use an everyday example or something that students recognize from their daily life so they kind of avoid the question of why do we have to know this. So the solution the mixture we're going to be using today is grape Kool-Aid. Uh, before you use this, though, you do have to prep your column. This is just regular, ordinary grape Kool-Aid. Without the sugar, you don't want to push too much sugar through this column. It's not a problem if you do. It's just a pain to clean up. But to to prepare your column, you have to start with 70% isopropyl alcohol. And a 10 milliliter syringe is really ideal for this particular cartridge because the cartridge fits right over top of the syringe tip. And I've actually started to use syringes a lot in my classroom. Uh, I use them just for a lot of different purposes. They're a lot handier than a graduated cylinder a lot of the time, and they dispense volume with as equal precision as my 10 milliliter graduated cylinder does. My students have also started to wonder what I, why I have so many different kinds, shapes, and sizes of syringes as well. The first cleaning you do is you just push 70% isopropyl alcohol. This is the same rubbing alcohol that you have in your grocery store or in your pharmacy. Uh, and they tell them just to push it through at about one milliliter a second, so it should take them about 10 seconds to go through the entire syringe. But you really want to moisten the column first and pack it with something that's a mixture of polar and nonpolar molecules before they get to the actual Kool-Aid. Now, after they've done that, I tell them this is very important. Liquids only go in one direction through your set pack funnel. So you have to pull the syringe off when you go to the next solution. Liquids only go down. They never go up through. Otherwise, you're not going to get any kind of a separation. You're going to prepare your column incorrectly. So the next thing we're going to take is just water. The solvent that we've used to dissolve our Kool-Aid is water, so you want to prepare the column with something similar to what you're going to be pushing through the first time. And any waste container will work for this. So once they've pushed through the isopropyl alcohol in the water, the column is ready to use. So I tell them to draw up 10 milliliters of the Kool-Aid solution. Uh, most directions that I've seen for this type of experiment say to prepare it to package directions, just omit the sugar. I found if I prepare it a little bit more concentrated, it works a little bit better. They can see the color separation a little bit nicer. So I usually prepare it either twice as concentrated or one and a half times more concentrated than the mix says. So instead of taking two quarts or two liters to one little packet of the Kool-Aid mixture, I'll do one liter or one and a half liters. Um, I have tried to store the solution from year to year. It grows mold, so I wouldn't suggest that. Just pour it down the drain and grab a new one the next year. And it's about 19 cents a packet now, so I don't think you have to worry too much about that expense. But the first solution we push through, and as they push through, and I'll angle this a little bit so if we look from the overhead camera, you can see that the solution coming out 
is completely colorless. And that kind of blows my students' mind the first time that they see it. And they'll often say, Jamie, it's not working. Nothing's coming through. And I said, well, what's the point of this lab? You're, you're separating things. And so it shouldn't go all the way through. You want to pull those dye molecules away from each other. So now all we've really done is we've pulled a lot of the dye molecules away from the solvent. And if you look at the cartridge, you can see that there's a really dark purple color right at the tip of the set pack cartridge. So now we have this cartridge that we need to somehow separate. We have purple dye here. Well, purple dye isn't purple dye. It's a mixture of red and blue. So we have to somehow separate the red and blue dye from each other. Well, if we use a different solvent, I've got 5% isopropyl alcohol here. If you just pull up 10 milliliters of 5% isopropyl alcohol, and this is just diluted 70%, and I start to push that through, you can start to see in the set pack first that the red starts coming through, and then it will start dripping through and appearing in the dish. Now, some of my students will sometimes call this color pink rather than red, and I do have to remind them that pink is just light red. But after they push through the red dye, they can still see that there's still some blue left in the cartridge. Now, one thing that you do if you make it more concentrated than less, you have to sometimes do a second or third wash. It doesn't always go through on the first time, and that's fine. I tell my kids, keep pushing through the 5% isopropyl alcohol till all of the red goes away. So I'm just going to push this through one more time to hopefully get out all of the red dye. And this can just go into a waste container. You don't need to keep storing it in the same container. But I just say, keep going until you don't see red anymore. And I'm going to start flooding my dish, so I'm going to go over here. One of the nice things about chromatography and the mixture separation is that the students can see very visually the color changes that are happening as they're separating these mixtures. Chromatography, chroma, the root word is color, so this was originally just a separation based on color. If you look at the cartridge now, though, it's almost completely solid blue. There's very, very little red, if any, left whatsoever inside the cartridge. So we've pushed through all the red and separated that. Well, if we want to separate the blue, we need to use a different combination of our solvent. So instead of 5% isopropyl alcohol, we're going to use 25%. And the same thing, 10 milliliters every single time. And if we push through with the 25%, you see a very brilliant blue color that starts to come through. And you can see by the end of the 10 milliliter extraction, there's virtually no dye left whatsoever inside the set pack cartridge. Now, these can be cleaned and reused. I've had the same set the entire time that I've been at my school, and I actually inherited from the teacher who retired before me. So these can be constantly cleaned and reused. The cleaning instructions are in your handout, and you just clean it with some more water, with some more isopropyl alcohol, push some air through it, and then just let it sit on the shelf. And the only thing that I ever use this for is for this demonstration or for this laboratory. So these can easily last you a very, very long time. I'm going to go to the board so we can talk a little bit more about what's happening inside of the reaction here, or in the separation here. So inside of your set pack cartridge, you have just basically you can think of them as small spheres or beads that are all covered with some kind of a nonpolar coating. The reason it's called a C18 is because it's a carbon chain that has 18 carbons of length in it. So this is very, very nonpolar, the stuff that we're feeding all these molecules through. When we start to put in dye molecules, I'll use X's for the red dyes and I don't know, squares for the blue dye. We pack all of these dye molecules in, and they sort of get trapped, because the dye molecules are not highly polar. So the molecules get trapped at the top. Well, that was with water, so all the water kind of pushes through the bottom. The first thing that we put in here was a 5% isopropyl alcohol solution. Well, if it's 5% isopropanol, what's the rest? It's 95% water. Well, if it's 95% water, and we know that water is still a highly polar molecule, we're going to pull the polar stuff through first. 
well, what die did we pull through first? When we push that really polar stuff through, all of the red molecules came through. So if the red goes through with a still fairly polar solvent, 95% water, red's got to be a fairly polar molecule in comparison to blue. So the second thing we push through, that was 25% isopropanol. If it's 25% isopropanol, what's the water content? 75%. So this is not quite as polar as our first one was. So when this makes its way through the solvent, it starts to pick up all of the blue molecules. So our blue has to be less polar than our red molecules were. Now, we have images of the red and the blue molecules. And if you want to look at this, you can see that red is, first of all, a smaller molecule than blue. Well, the polar parts of a molecule are an important thing to talk about. If this was an intro chemistry level course, I probably would not show them the structures because this would sort of scare them away a little bit. But for an AP or a second level chemistry course, you could easily go into a little bit more detail about what the reasons for this polarity difference are. So if you look at the red molecule, there aren't nearly as many carbons here. You do have some ions. The ions are a highly polar part, and those are soluble in water. OH groups are capable of hydrogen bonding. Even the nitrogens might be able to do a little bit of hydrogen bonding. Ether is not as much. Much, but you have a couple of sites and a fairly small amount of carbon to carbon bonds. Carbon to carbon bonds are completely nonpolar. But if you look at the blue molecule, there are actually twice as many, even more than twice as many carbon to carbon and carbon to hydrogen bonds in this molecule. It still has those little ionic parts. In fact, there's one more. But there's no OH group that would be attracted to water through hydrogen bonding. You have a little bit of charges, but you have a whole lot of nonpolar rings. So why does blue come together with the nonpolar solvent? It's a less polar molecule based on its molecular structure. And this demonstration is a really nice one that you can use either as a demonstration or as a lab set for your students to demonstrate a different way, a really powerful way that chromatography can separate something that they're used to seeing every day. There are a lot of variations to this. You can easily use different Kool-Aids. I've used orange Kool-Aid, and it still works. It'll separate it into yellow and red. You can use lemon-lime Kool-Aid. That will go from green into yellow. Uh, you can have students bring in whatever drink they want to, so Gatorade or Powerade or energy drinks or sodas or anything that's got a dye in it. They can bring it in and separate it. If they do bring in a soda pop, though, it would be good to have them bring in a day before and let it decarbonate in an open beaker or an open glass overnight or boil some of the carbon dioxide out of it. Uh, otherwise, it starts to get a little bit of back pressure when you push it through the syringe, and it's not going to give you a good separation. The other thing you have to watch is if they bring in their own drinks, there's going to be a lot of sugar, so they're going to want to rinse a lot of times with water at the end to make sure it doesn't get gummy and sticky inside of that column, then it's not going to work correctly. But hopefully you'll find this demonstration or lab a really useful and powerful way of getting another aspect or another version of chromatography into your classroom. Thank you.